Okay, good morning. Any questions? Is there any aspect of the course that you don't like? That you think we should change? Because it's tough. <laughs> You're doing okay, that's all I want to know. Second assignment is out oh there. Have you taken a look at it? No? Uh, I've talked to Rob this morning and he assures me that uh, we have to install the symbolic toolbox in the lab. And uh, he also has a software that allows broadcasting of the screen to your workstation. He has installed it also. So maybe next week if we meet, we should uh, have access to that. Which is the license to um, if there are no questions, then uh, let's just continue. Today I want to complete a review of Laplace transform and then move on to uh, some of the core part of this course, uh, which is to look at dynamical systems, develop what is called transfer functions, and uh, then look at the response of dynamical systems to various uh, types of equations. Now, there's one thing that uh, you will come across when you do the current assignment that you probably need some help. I'm not sure. So uh, I'm going to use this example to talk about that aspect. That is, there is an equivalence between a higher order differential equation like this and a system of first order equations. Now, a higher order equation, you can apply Laplace transform and using the rules, you can get uh, the solution. And for the last problem, I ask you to look at uh, the details are given here, but I ask you to study how to do the partial fractions. The special case in this situation is that there are three eigenvalues or three characteristic roots uh, of the factor that you will get in the denominator of uh, the Laplace transform variable, like here, after you do the transformation you get s plus 1 cubed. That means there are three values of s that are identical. s equal to minus 1 would satisfy three times. So this is what we call the repeated root, a root of the characteristic equation that appears more than once. Then the solution, the partial fraction process is slightly modified. And I have outlined here, but I'm not going to go through that in the class. I want you to study that. And I told you in the last lecture, come back and ask me questions. If you have questions, please do ask. Otherwise, if you want to come and talk to me individually in my office, that's fine too. But the final solution is, after you do the partial fraction, it's going to be this expression, 1 over s minus 1 over s plus 1 q minus 1 over s plus 1 square minus 1 over s plus 1. And when you do the inverse transform for that, you will get this as the solution. So I'm not really going to talk about it, but what I'm going to talk about is using this example to illustrate how to pose this problem, reframe this problem as a system of first order equations, instead of a third order equation as a system of three first order equations. Why? Well, MATLAB can handle only a system of first order equations. MATLAB cannot handle a higher order differential equation. It just did it like that because all the algorithms for integrating differential equations have been developed for first order systems and there is an equivalent. So you can go from this system to the other system. And that's what I want to talk about. How do we reformulate this problem in the form of a system of first order equations? In the assignment write up, I explain what this uh, final output should look like, but what I'm going to do here is show the steps involved in that. Okay? So our objective is to take this differential equation and put it into a form of dy dt equals f of y comma t. Now whenever I put an underscore, that means it's a vector. Okay? So y is going to be a vector of length 3. And MATLAB can handle vectors very naturally. Okay? And f is also going to be a function 
a vector function with three functions in it. And I need to, once I put it in this form, then I can write my little function file for MATLAB, which I can use with ODE45. I'm going to show, I'll show the whole process of how that is done. Uh, okay, so how do we begin? First, look at the highest order term. <laughs> Excuse me, inverse potential equation. So in this case, it is the third order term. So the number of first order equations you're going to get are three. So if you have a first order system, you'll end up with four first order equations. If you have a second order system, you'll end up with two first order equations, etc. Okay? And the process is I'm going to define a set of new variables. Okay? And I'm going to define y1 as simply x, y2 as dx dt and y3 as d square x dt square. Okay. So since I know that I am going to have only three variables, I'm defining these three variables as the original function x, its first derivative and its second derivative. What I'm really interested in actually is only y1, x. x is the solution that I want, x as a function of t. Okay. So this is strictly a definition of a new set of variables and my vector y becomes this component, y1, y2, y3. Okay. So when I write dy dt, what I'm writing is I'm actually saying that it is dy1 dt, dy2 dt, dy3 dt. So there are going to be three equations. Instead of a single equation, I'm going to have three equations. I guess I'm kind of running out of space, so maybe I'll open up a new So, uh, the differential equation is d cube x dt cube plus uh, three d square x dt square plus three dx dt. I guess I need to look at that. I don't quite <laughs> remember. My apologies, I just need to go back and plus x equal to 1, you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, plus x equal to 1, thank you. Okay. So, I've defined y1 as equal to x, y2 as equal to dx dt, sorry, just x, and uh, y3 as equal to d square x dt square. Okay. So mm -hmm. what I want to do is get three equations for dy1 dt. So I take the first equation and take its derivative dy1 dt. But that is nothing but dx dt. Simply so taking the derivative of that. But dx dt is the same as y2 because that I know by looking at this one. Okay, so I'm using that. And that becomes my first function, f1. So my first function, f1, is simply y2. Okay? Then I take the second equation, dy2 dt. And when I take the derivative, I'm going to get d squared x dt squared. But d squared x dt squared is nothing but, what is it? y3. That is going to be my next function, f2. Okay? So I have one equation, one differential equation, which is dy1 dt equals f1, which is y2, the second differential equation, and I'm going to give the third differential equation, which is dy3 dt, which is equal to d cube x dt cube. Now I'm going to use the original equation that is given to find out what is d x cube, d cube x dt cube, that is this term. Okay? So I'm going to look at this term and move the original to the right hand side and get my function f3 from that. Oops. So f3 is going to be 1 minus x minus 3dx dt minus 3d square x dt squared. So all I've done is 
for the last equation, I need the third derivative, and I'm keeping the third derivative on the left-hand side, moving everything else to the right-hand side. All this goes to the right-hand side. Okay? And that is my F3, the third function. But this is in terms of x dx dt, so I want to get rid of them. So I'm going to write this as 1 minus, what is x? x is the same as y1 minus 3 times dx dt. dx dt is the same as y2 minus 3 times d squared x dt squared, which is the same as y3. Okay? So now I have successfully transformed, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, still, I have the screen resolution problem. What I see here, you don't see. Is it okay now? Can you see the whole thing? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, what I have, I'm going to summarize it now. What I have is B y1 dt, which is my first function, which is y2, okay? And dy2 dt, which is my second function, is simply y3, okay? And dy3 dt, which is my third function, which is 1 minus y1 minus 3 y2 minus 3 y3. So this is what we call a system of first order equations. They're all first order. The highest derivative is only first order. But, but it's a system, meaning it's coupled. It depends on every one. For example, y2 affects y1, y3 affects y2, and y1, y2, y3 affects y3. So all of them influence each other. Okay? Any questions on that? Now what we need, before I can go and program this into MATLAB, so we saw how to get analytically using MATLAB transform, now we are saying how to solve the same thing in MATLAB, okay? You're saying it's ODE45. Before I do that, I need an initial condition for Y1, Y2, and Y3. What are the initial conditions? Can anybody kind of... All zero. Why? Because Y1 is nothing but X. The initial conditions are... The initial conditions are x at 0 is 0, x prime at 0 is 0, and x double prime at 0 is 0. Okay? That gives you all the initial conditions because x is nothing but y1, x prime is y2, x double prime is y3. Okay? So initial condition vector that you need at t equal to 0 is going to be 0, 0, 0. So y is a vector containing three elements, y1, y2, y3. Now, what would be the vector f? It would be simply y2, y3, 1 minus y1, minus 3, y2, minus 3, y3. This is what we mean by a vector function. Each one is a function, but uh, it is given in general in terms of y1, y2, y3. In general, you could have, MATLAB can handle a system where F1, the first function, depends on all y1, y2, y3. In this particular case, it happens that it depends only on y2. Similarly, y2, dy2, dt, depends, f2 depends only on y3. But in general, in MATLAB algorithm, it could depend on any of the all three functions, variables. Okay? Any questions on that? This is exactly what I want you to do in the second problem. Go through the process of transforming a higher order system and understand the equivalence between a higher order system and a system of first order equation. So if I want to do this in uh, MATLAB, all I need to do is uh, so this you will write a function like this. Okay. So the first function is y2, which is what we figured out. The next function is y3, and the third function is 1 minus y1 minus 3y2 minus 3y3. So it takes in as input t and y. Now y is a vector containing three elements, y1, y2, and y3. Those are used on the right hand side to evaluate the three functions and it will return the three functions. Okay? So if you are given a higher order problem and asked to solve it using MATLAB, this is the road that you need to follow. And then once you have the function stored in your works uh, directory, you just go here and 
t comma y for example equals o d e four five that's the function name I call this as l zero eight for lecture zero eight and then I'm saying integrate from zero to ten minutes and the three initial conditions zero 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 I'm not even using options here okay uh, I'm using the options this is the default one. So to solve the problem, now I can say plot t comma y. How many graphs should I get? How many curves should I get in the graph? Three. Because y is a vector containing three elements. Okay. So if you, for example, just type y, you get three columns. What is the first column? That is the solution you want. That is y1, which is x. The second column is the derivative. The third column is the second derivative. Okay. So if you say plot t comma y, Plus all the three curves, but this one is going to be the solution. Okay. Now, let me go back to the analytical solution. Okay. So the analytical solution that we saw for the same problem is given by Well, it should be inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s uh, multiplied by 1 over s plus 1 q. So I can create that by creating sums x t s and then x is equal to uh, i Laplace of 1 divided by s divided by s plus 1 Okay, so this is the analytical expression. Now I can create a graph again. So let's just say x a for analytical one. Uh, let me create a vector t. Well, I can use the t already because I have t here. No, I guess not. So t is equal to 0 0.210. Okay, and then x analytic. I want you to ask me if there are any questions. You're not following what I'm doing. Okay, uh, is equal to sub x comma t. Hold plot t comma x a comma any questions in whatever I've done so far? What am I trying to do? Plot an analytical solution on the same graph with symbols so that I can compare. Okay, so I'm saying just use the O as the symbol. Okay, so the original curve was a solid line, which was a, a numerical one from OD45, and the dots there, the circles that you see on that. For the analytical solution for the same variable x, yeah. You could do it in a couple of different ways. This one automatically generates a column vector. OD45 expects a column vector return for function. So I could do this if you want. Then it will be a row vector, but in the last column I can say f equals f transpose. That will work fine as well. But if you don't do that, what do you will complain? Matrix dimensions don't agree. That kind of a complaint. So, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, let's then uh, move on to the next important conceptual thing. And that is the qualitative nature of solutions. Okay, so we talked about these characteristic roots of differential equations as being eigenvalues. Oh, maybe I should point out another. What is the relationship between the eigenvalues and this? Um, okay, so here I have. 
suppose the three dimensional problem into three first order equations. But I can also write this in the form of dy dt equals ay plus b. How many of you can do that? If I say take this to the next step and recast this particular set of equations in this form. Why am I asking you to do this? I'm just asking you to find what is the matrix A and the vector B. Okay? Such that when you carry out the vector matrix product, you will get these three terms on the right hand side. So the meaning of this d by dt on the left hand side is y remember a is y1, y2, y3. So the d dt, d dt operating on y1, y2, y3 on the left hand side will give you dy1 dt, dy2 dt, and dy3 dt. This is on the left hand side. So when you do a matrix multiplication on the right hand side, it should give you these three functions. So by looking at it, can you fill in the blank for the 3 by 3 matrix? I will just fill you this, y1, y2, y3, and b. So I'll take a shot at it. What would be the term that goes here? 0. The next one it goes here. 1. Next one. Okay. And you can now is it clear? If it's not clear, please do ask. Okay. And the next one is going to be this one is going to be zero, zero, and the last one will be one because there is a one here. Okay. But in the second row, if you look at it, it's going to be zero, zero, and one. In the third one is going to be minus one. Negative 1, negative 3, negative 3. Okay? So, this is the matrix. This matrix contains the same information as the differential operator contains. Okay? So, when I calculate the eigenvalue of this matrix, for example, going to MATLAB, um, okay, I define a matrix A as 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then what do I minus one, minus three. I have a very bad memory. Thank you very much. Okay. So that is your matrix A. If you do the eigenvalue calculation of this matrix, what do you think you should get? The three eigenvalues, the three rows, which are minus one, minus one, minus one. Okay? Because remember, we factored it and obtained it as one over S plus one Q. That's the repeated group. So there are three eigenvalues, three roots that are repeating itself. So the eigenvalue of the matrix is the same as the uh, roots of the characteristic equation. Okay? And it is the nature of these eigenvalues that determines what type of dynamic response you will have. So you need to have a very good understanding of qualitative understanding of what kind of eigenvalues gives what kind of response. So that you can then manipulate and control the response to be the way that you want it. Any questions on this? I'm making myself clear. Yeah. The characteristic root of the differential equation. Yeah. What do I mean by that? No. The characteristic root of a differential equation like this, you will do you know from differential equations how do you obtain? Okay. When you do the Laplace transform. It's basically the same thing, but it appears in the Laplace domain. Okay, there it appears as the root of the terms in the denominator. So when you do the Laplace transform, we have basically obtained x of s as equal to one over s times s plus one q. So the roots of these are s equal to minus one, s equal to minus one, s equal to minus one three times. Okay, but when you, that that is the eigenvalue. Another way of looking at it is. If you take this differential equation and write its characteristic root, the way that you would have seen in the differential equation, it will be simply written as m cubed plus 3m squared plus 3m plus 1 equal to 0. And how is this done? So if you look at the derivative, if it is a third derivative, it is m cubed. And then 3 times second derivative, m squared. Okay, this is the differential equation of the constant coefficient. So solve this with uh, algebraic polynomial, third degree polynomial. Okay, 
solve this by using any root finding scheme. And those are your characteristic roots of that particular differential equation. And the solutions are given in terms of e to the power that m1 t e to the power m2 t e to the power m3 t. Because this is the third degree polynomial, you will have three roots. Why is it? Oh, that, that's a good question. S comes from the right hand side, the forcing term. When I take the Laplace transform of 1, I get 1 over S. Okay? So that, that is not a root of what you call the homogeneous part of the differential equation. Now we need to really refresh what you have learned in differential equations. If you have a differential equation like this, the solution that you would traditionally construct would be setting the right hand side equal to zero. Then you get the characteristic equation, you get your homogeneous part. Then for every right hand side, you get a particular solution forcing that. Okay? So in this case, it's a good observation. S comes from the right hand side, the forcing term. And the remaining part comes only from 1 plus 3 m, uh, m cubed plus 3 m squared plus 3 m plus 1. That you can factor as simply m plus 1 cubed equal to zero. So the three roots are m equal to minus one, minus one, minus one. Okay. Any other question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what I've shown here is how to rewrite these three equations in a vector matrix form. So that when you do the product multiplication, you get back those, those three equations. Okay. For example, if I take the vector matrix product of this row with this column, okay, this row with this column, and then add it to this, I'm going to get zero times y1 times one times y2 plus zero times y3 plus zero, which is my first equation. Okay. That's what your question is. Well, I think So what is the connection between that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Let's again forget about the particular part. Focus on the homogeneous part. Okay. So, so if you are given an equation like this, dy dt equals a y. Okay, just the homogeneous part. What is it? The question is, which is a very good question, what is it? Why is the eigenvalue of this related to the solution? Okay. In the previous, is that your question? Is that what you're asking? Oh. More like, what is the eigenvalue? Oh, what is the eigenvalue? <laughs> okay, okay. We'll, we'll do it with this one. Okay. So consider a homogeneous differential equation of this form. What is the eigenvalue? But if there is a forcing term, this would be called the forcing term that gives you a particular solution. We are looking at homogeneous solution of a differential equation like this. Now, if you are given a differential equation as a higher order equation, the path is to write the characteristic root and get the characteristic root. I'm saying that is the same as the eigenvalues. Now, I'm going to kind of introduce what eigenvalues are in a matrix context because you're going to use the matrix form quite often in this course, okay, when you go to state space representation. So, now I'm going to let the solution be of the form y, which is the vector, equals v some unknown vector times e to the power lambda t. Lambda is some unknown constant. So this is my proposal for the solution. Now I'm going to take the solution, plug it into the differential equation, and see whether I can satisfy the differential equation by a suitable choice of this vector and this lambda. And lambda will be called the eigenvalue, and v will be called the eigenvector. But if I take the derivative of this, what do I get? V and lambda are constant. If I take the derivative of this, it's a vector. What do I get? V is a constant. So derivative of e to the power lambda t. What is that? Lambda times e to the power lambda t. Okay. Now take this and substitute on both sides. On the left hand side v y dt and on the right hand side t. So you're going to get v lambda e to the power lambda t is equal to a, which is the matrix, multiplied by y, but y is v e to the power lambda t. 
Okay? So if the probability T appears on both sides, I can cancel that out. Okay? So what I'm left with is this equation. A times some unknown vector V equal to lambda times some the same vector V. This is what I defined as eigenvector in the some, uh, tutorial yesterday. Eigenvector is a special vector, which when you multiply it by A, gives you back the same vector. In general, if you multiply a matrix by a vector, you get a different vector. So matrix is transform vectors into vectors. But an eigenvector is something that is satisfied by this equation. Remember, still, B and lambda are unknowns, because that's how we started with. I want to find out what that B is, find out what that lambda is. That's where this equation will be satisfied. Now, if this is the case, then I can write as A minus lambda I multiplied by V equal to zero. What am I doing? I'm simply moving it to the left hand side. Okay? And identity matrix multiplied by lambda is simply lambda. Okay? So multiplied by V is equal to zero. So we're following so far. Now you ask the question, what should be the condition set on this matrix such that you can get a non-trivial solution? Obviously the solution is V equal to zero. Right? That will satisfy the equation. But if V equal to zero, then you don't get any solution because your solution depends on V. Okay? This is why you say we want a non-trivial solution, meaning not equal to zero. Under what condition can you get a solution? Again, you need to call the linear algebra. What does the linear algebra tell you? <laughs> no, you're <laughs> There are certain values of lambda for which the determinant of this is equal to zero. Okay? So you want, because you don't, you guys don't regret asking this question, right? <laughs> That's what you're thinking. <laughs> I'm just refreshing what you have learned or you should have learned in linear algebra. Determinant of this A minus lambda I is equal to zero. So you find those values of lambda that satisfy this condition that the determinant is equal to zero. Then you'll find that you can solve for what are the eigenvectors. MATLAB routine EIG does this for you, solves this particular equation. So if somebody asks you what is an eigenvalue problem, I can run the problem is simply if you give me a matrix, matrix times some vector equals lambda times the same vector. This is the eigenvalue problem. Written this way or written this way. Okay? And we need to find what is the corresponding eigenvalue. Okay? Now, the last point that should kind of show the similarity between the characteristic root and this method is the following. What is the determinant of a matrix? Do you know how to write the determinant of a matrix? If it is a two by two matrix, let's do that. For a two by two. But you remember that right. So if I have to write it in component form, it's going to be A11 minus lambda, A12, A21, A22 minus lambda. For a two by two system. For a three by three system, You'll have the same thing, A11, A12, A13, etc. Okay? So I want the determinant of this to be written as A11 minus lambda multiplied by A22 minus lambda minus A12 times A21 equal to zero. I want the determinant to be equal to zero. This is also called a characteristic polynomial. Okay? Called the characteristic polynomial of a particular matrix because it depends on the matrix coefficient, A11, A12, etc. What is the degree of this polynomial? Two, because you'll get, when you expand it, you'll get lambda square. So this will have two roots. And these two roots are the same characteristic roots that we obtained with the other way. Okay? Does that answer your question? Okay, okay, that's good. Okay, I've seen it before, it's just a matter of refreshing it. Did you, did you have a question? Yeah, um, you're not going to get zero, you're going to get a non-zero uh, vector. 
thing is, if the determinant is not zero, then the only way that you can satisfy V is equal to zero. So then what you're doing is, if I have um, this V is going to be written as zero divided by, you cannot do this properly in matrix, so you need to actually have an inverse. Okay? So the way that you need to write the solution as V is equal to inverse of A minus lambda I multiplied by uh, zero. Because right hand side is zero. You follow that, what I've written there. Okay. So the inverse, if you make it as equal to zero, then what you get is it is equal to zero by zero. Okay. If the inverse is not zero, then it is some number multiplied by zero. That means V must be equal to zero. Okay. So we cannot have a determinant of this A minus lambda I to be non-zero. We want to force it to be equal to zero. Then you get a zero by zero, and that allows you to choose V to be non-zero. Okay. You get a certain degree of freedom that you can allow uh, choose how to calculate uh, V. But the key is to make the determinant of that ca characteristic polynomial equal to zero. And that gives you a way of calculating lambda 1 and lambda 2, the two roots. You do, you do. And, and uh, you never need to worry about calculating by hand. Okay? There is a way that MATLAB calculates both the lambda and the V. And MATLAB, in fact, returns both of them. Okay? So if you go to MATLAB session and uh, put V comma D as equal to this, the I routine will return two matrices. The first one would be the eigenvectors, the three eigenvectors. And the second matrix, B, is equal to the three columns. Each column of the matrix is an eigenvector. Okay? And the second matrix, D, is a diagonal matrix that will contain the eigenvalues, which we went through uh, in, the, uh, in the last class. So here you see 1, minus 1, minus 1. These three are the eigenvalues, the second matrix. So you should be able to compute it using MATLAB. You don't have to be able to do it by hand. But you should, I should understand what an eigenvalue is. It's a solution to this problem, and what an eigenvector is. Okay. And in the next tutorial, I'll give you a few more calculations that we can do in MATLAB uh, on eigenvalues and eigenvectors to show the similarity between characteristic groups of a polynomial and the eigenvalues. Okay. Um, there is a command called poly, I think. And if you pass a matrix, it returns the coefficients of the polynomial. What is this polynomial? This is the expansion of this. What it does is it finds the determinant, expands it, and gives you the coefficient of the polynomial. Okay? That's why MATLAB I like so much. It's very, very powerful. It makes a lot of our tedious job very easy. So you can take a 3 by 3 matrix, or 20 by 20 matrix on the matter, pass it to poly, it will find the determinant, do the expansion of the polynomial, 20 by 3 polynomial, and give you all the coefficients. Okay? And if you recall these coefficients, you can see it is the same as the characteristic group, 1, 3, 3, 1. Okay? 1 is the coefficient of b cube x d t cube, 3 is the coefficient of b square x d t square, etc. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, uh, let's get back to the notes. Do you find the switching back and forth? Uh, you can live with it. You're on a bit. Okay. So, what do we mean by qualitative nature of the solution? So, we have seen what are eigenvalues characteristic groups, they are the same, and they determine the nature of the solution. Okay? So here, if I have a real root, okay, the characteristic root, you can call it lambda, you can call it m, but if it is real negative, the solution is going to be of this form, e to the power minus a1t. And that solution decays with time, like this. Monotonically decays with time. 
Now, that is a, always the feature. If you have only a pure negative eigenvalue, then the solution will be like this. What I'm going to show you is a graph like this, where I'm going to plot what are the possible locations for eigenvalues. Now, eigenvalues can be complex because these are roots. Roots can be complex. Okay. So if I have the first case is if I have a real negative root, that means on the real axis there is no imaginary part anywhere on this line. The solution is always going to be a monotonic decay like this, starting with some initial condition. Solution is e to the power minus a one t. Similarly, if I have an eigenvalue on the right hand side, real axis, anywhere here, then it is positive. So what will the solution look like for this one? Time e to the power. Here I call it a five t. It's going to be an exponentially growing solution. It's going to blow up. These are unstable solutions. You don't want them in a new chemical plant. You don't want any um, positive eigenvalues because they always give rise to blow up. Now, if I had a solution like this, which has both a negative part, real negative part, and an imaginary part, okay, what does the solution look like? It's going to be an oscillatory but decaying one. Because why? The solution will be written as e to the power minus a2t times cos b2t plus sine b2t. Okay? These are the real imaginary part, a2 and b2, minus a2 and b2. So the solution for this one is going to look like this. Oscillating but decaying, going to zero. Why does it decay? Because this term eventually dominates. As t goes to infinity, that term goes to zero. It multiplies the sine and cosine term. Okay? Similarly, if you take this term, it is positive. So what will happen to this? Oscillate and expand. Okay? The solution for this is going to be like this. Blow up. Again, we don't want that. Okay? We don't want blow up either exponentially, uh, monotonically, or in an oscillatory fashion. Okay? What happens if it is right on the imaginary axis? Magnitude will stay constant. The magnitude is controlled by the e to the power term. So if there is no e to the power term, e to the power zero t, which is one, okay, then the imaginary part b three. Like remember, this one is zero and b three. Okay, the solution for this one will be cos b three t plus sine b three t, something like this. Okay? This one will have a sustained oscillation like this, constant amplitude. Whatever. This may or may not be desirable. Okay? Ideally, we should be on what we call the left half plane on this side. We want to be on this side. We want to design our controller in such a way we push all the eigenvalues to the left hand side. Okay? So that we get either a stable monotonic decrease or an oscillating decrease. And that's basically what I have summarized in the right up here, the various cases. Okay? Any questions on that? That's a very important diagram, and you should understand qualitatively what are the various kinds of responses a dynamical system can have. Okay. Basically, monotonic decrease or monotonic increase, left and right sides of the uh, real axis, and then decaying oscillations or growing oscillations, and then right on the imaginary axis, if you have purely imaginary eigenvalues, okay, then you have sustained oscillations. What happens if it is right in there? I can value zero. Yeah, do you have a question? Uh, the imaginary root, that's a good question. Uh, the imaginary root will always occur in pair. One will be positive, one will be negative. Okay? That's again the theorem that you must have seen way back in polynomial. If you have a polynomial, the roots of a polynomial are always occur in complex conjugate pairs. 
if the polynomial itself does not have any complex coefficients. If the polynomial coefficients are all real numbers, then it must occur as a pair. And that's why the figures that you see here, they're always as a pair. This one is paired with this one. Okay, and this one is paired with this one. Okay, so there will be both a positive and a negative imaginary part. Any other questions? Okay, a few other simple wrap-ups. Um, yes, sorry. Is there a difference in the graph of the two points on the imaginary axis and the two points on the imaginary axis? Will they be the same, but will they also be the same? It's the same graph because the, these are paired up always. Remember what I said, imaginary roots are always paired up. So these two pairs make up uh, a pair of eigenvalues. So the solution to that will be the same. You don't have an eigenvalue that occurs only with a positive imaginary axis or a negative imaginary value. If the coefficients of your differential equations are all real, then the eigenvalues must occur in pairs. So if you have plus B3, that must be a minus B3. They go together. And when you write the solution, the solution looks like this. So this graph is actually for the pair. OK? That's your question. Uh, yeah, the center point is called neutrally stable. So wherever the system is left, it just stays there. There is no dynamical force to move it away from there. Uh, for stability, I guess this is another picture that you might have uh, seen. Um, if I have, for example, a parabolic dish and I put a ball there and I kick the ball and write the dynamical equation that governs the motion of the ball, what should happen to the ball? To always come back to its bottom position. So that is what you typically would call as a stable system. For that, the eigenvalues will be on the left-hand side. So any kick that you give, any forcing that you give for the patient will die down. Now, if I have a situation like this, an inverted one, and I place the ball right there, the slightest kick is going to take it away from there. Where does it go? We don't know. Okay? But it's an unstable system. Now, what would be equivalent to one that's right in the middle? If I have a flat surface, and I put a ball there. Then if I kick it, it just goes there and stays there in the new position. Okay? But there is no restoring force, there is no force that takes it away from there. So this is what you would call a neutrally stable system. Neutral stability. This is stable, meaning negative eigenvalues, and this is unstable, meaning positive eigenvalues. This one is lambda is equal to zero. Now, uh, just to wrap up a few simple things, there is something called the final value theorem in uh, Laplace transform, which allows you to find out what is the final value of the solution as t goes to infinity. As t goes to infinity, what is the final value of a function? If you know it's Laplace transform. Okay? Why would this be important? We found out if you give me a differential equation, I can transform it, I can get the Laplace transform of the solution. But to invert back, it may be a difficult problem. Sometimes you may not be able to invert back. But at least you can tell what will be the final steady state by simply looking at the transformed function. The rule is multiply it by s and put s equal to 0. Whatever number that you get is going to be the steady state value for the original solution. As an example, I have one of the examples that we did previously, x of s in the transform variable is given by 1 over s times s cubed plus 3s squared plus 3s plus 1. Now, if I ask you the question, what is the final value, all you need to do is multiply this by s, so the s cancels out, okay, and then put s equal to 0. So wherever you have s, put s equal to 0. And what is left with is 1. So the final steady state solution x of t, as t goes to infinity, this should go to 1. 
that is very useful because you can get the final statistic solution right away right, without really having to compute anything. Okay? So the final value theorem is extremely useful. And there is another one called the initial value theorem, which is not so useful, but still the theorem is there. We simply say, what is the function value at t equal to 0? Typically, this is known from initial condition. right? So this is why it's not as useful. But the theorem simply says, it's a mirror image of it. Take the same function, but put s equal to infinity, you get the value for t equal to 0 from that. And the translation theorem we already saw, that if I have a function f and then multiplied by e to the power minus a t, is the same as taking the transform of the function adding s plus a. So whenever that is s, replace it by s plus a. This is uh, equal to multiplying the original function by e to the power minus a t. This we will find useful because whenever you have piping system, for example, in a chemical plant, you open the valve, it takes a few minutes for the flow rate to be felt in the next process unit. This is called a time delay. And the time delay processes are typically modeled by e to the power minus a t term. So this will occur. The transformation, the delay will occur in the Laplace transform. And we saw again an example of this already in one of the lectures. If I have e to the I mean, if I have that Laplace transform of cos kt, which is given by this, if that is multiplied by e to the power minus at, the transform of the new variable is replace f by s plus a whenever you have. Okay, that's the Laplace transform of the product. Um, this is almost out of time. So let me just complete with the last one. Integral, we have already seen that the plus term of the integral is equivalent to dividing by s. Derivative is multiplying by s, integral is dividing by s. So if you give me a differential equation of this form, using the differential equation theory, it will be difficult to solve this because you have derivative on the left hand side and integral on the right hand side. But we should prepare ourselves to do this. Why? Because the integral action, integral control action on the right hand side will have a term like that. But in Laplace transform, it's very easy because on the left hand side, I just have transformed the derivative as f times x of s minus x of 0, which is 3. Okay. And then on the right hand side, the integral, Laplace transform of the integral is Laplace transform of the function divided by s. Okay. And then minus t, Laplace transform of t is 1 over s squared. So it's as easy to solve a differential integral equation where you have both derivative term and integral term in the plus term the domain. And the solution is given by this. And of course, we need to do I Laplace to invert it or use partial fractions. Okay. So that completes basically what I wanted to do in Laplace transform review. So next step is to look at dynamical equations back and put, put them in the Laplace transform form and deal with something called transfer functions. So the control theory really begins from now on. All this is themes of what is preparatory material. Okay. All right. So if you have any questions um, on your assignment, please feel free to drop by or email me or whatever. And next week, do you want a similar session in MATLAB? How many of you would still feel that you need it? Because pretty soon, I think you'll become comfortable enough. You won't need it. I'm hoping it will occur earlier. <laughs> The homework? The next homework. probably. I'll, I'll give you a bit of a last <laughs> time. <laughs> It'll be due the Friday afterwards. The Friday afterwards, we have a holiday. Right? Monday and Wednesday? Wednesday will have class. Oh, OK. So Wednesday is also off. Okay. So do you want an assignment before that, before you go on holidays? No. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you that because the exam starts the week after. The term exam is the week after. And we come back. Okay. So I'm going to give you a problem set to look at. And I'll make the assignment due after the exam. But at least you will have a set of problems that you will have done before the exam. Okay? So I will give you a problem next Wednesday. I might as well give it to you early and whatever you want to do with it, but it will be due after you come back after the exam. Okay?